Hello friends, welcome to 3ABN Today. My name is John Lomakang, but you know that if you've tuned in before, if this is your first time, note this channel. We believe that the Lord has ordained it to get people ready for the coming of the Lord. And I am particularly excited about today's program. Now, I believe in the three angels' messages. I wrote a booklet on that. Uh, that's a little plug in there. But um, today we have three guests that are not angels, but they are flying in the midst of heaven. And you'll find out in just a moment what I mean by that. But uh, this is an exciting program because there are places in the world that cannot be reached other than by flight. And these three gentlemen will tell you how you can enhance your future, how you can experience what it means to get off the ground without your own wings and be able to either navigate or pilot a plane. And since I like flight, I'm really looking forward to the rest of this interview. But uh, before we go any further, thank you for all that you do for this network as we continue going and growing, getting ready for the coming of our Lord. We're going to be blessed with a wonderful song. My good dear sister, Yvonne Lewis Shelton, is going to bless us with the song, In Christ Alone. alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when the fears are stilled and striving cease my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. Ooh. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in the helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness Scorned by the ones he came to save To on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid Here in the death of Christ guilt 
in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns to take me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. No power of hell, no scheme of man can Thank you so much for that song, Yvonne. I appreciate that. Now let me take the time to introduce our guest today. To my immediate right is David McComber. Am I saying that correctly? McComber. So you got to throw that accent at me. <laughs> Sorry. But hey, good to have you here, David. Welcome to 3ABN. Thank you. And briefly tell our viewers and listeners what your role is at the Andrews University Department of Aviation. Well, so I teach at the, or at the university. Um, I teach on the flight side, so I'm preparing our students for all the knowledge that they need to know, mm -hmm. as well as checking them when they are going through flight training to make sure that they're learning everything they need to know um, Good. As, they, as they progress in their career. Understanding all the things that pertain to aviation. All the switches, everything that's going on in the back of the airplane, everything that's going on in the pilot's mind. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot to it, so wow, we're going to check them and make sure. We're going to dive into some of those details. I love flight. And Jonathan Larson, good to have you here today. Thank you. And tell our viewers and listeners what you do as, as it pertains to the aviation program. I'm the director of maintenance, so we do all of our own maintenance for the airplanes in-house. So every 100 flight hours and every annual, I can take the airplane apart, take all the inspection panels off and the seats out and make sure the things that are supposed to move still move and those that aren't supposed to move aren't moving. <laughs> so we, uh, we make sure the airplanes are safe and, and good to go for the students. That is important to know because when you are clear for takeoff, it's good to know you'll be able to come back. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Good to have you here, Jonathan. And um, Assistant Professor Jeremy Alexander. Good to have you here today. Thank you very much, Pastor. Once again, uh, Jeremy Alexander. I uh, work alongside these two quality gentlemen here. Um, they help uh, keep me in check. They also teach me a lot, and so uh, it's a privilege to work with them. I, uh, once again, I teach classes along with uh, giving flight instruction. Uh, soon enough, I'll be in the same position as David as the assistant chief flight instructor, and I'll also be able to give checks as well. Okay. But in the meantime, I'm happy uh, learning the process. Okay, good. I found out a small detail about you not too long ago that you were in the Navy and you were a pilot in the Navy. Just kind of briefly tell us about that. That is correct. Uh, I was a carrier qualified Navy pilot um, for the period of about four and a half years. It's certainly a tremendous experience and I learned a lot from that. And I'll probably share a bit more about that too um, as, as the interview goes on. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, quite an experience. So you've taken off and landed on an aircraft carrier. That is correct. Did they stabilize the ocean to make it, that make it easier? <laughs> oh, that would certainly be nice, but you know, you don't always get that privilege. <laughs> wow, I've yeah. seen that in uh, outside of a nice, safe flight simulator. I haven't had that experience, <laughs> but so glad to have you here today. David, give us a little brief history of the program at Andrews. How long has it been around? What kind of impact has it had on the world? Well, so Andrews has been around since the early 1970s. Right. Um, and th so the flight program specifically. Yeah. Um, and Andrews actually started out as kind of the mission aviation hub mm. for the Avenist Church. So from a span from roughly 1976 to 1979, Andrews was involved in putting out dozens of airplanes. We have record of um, collaborating with Quiet Hour Ministries mm -hmm. to put out about 50 airplanes in that span of time. Um, and by the end of the 1970s, we had about 120 aircraft worldwide um, serving in mission positions. 
throughout wow. the world. That's an interesting uh, statistic because when you think about a university, well, you know, there are the universities, I'm sure, that have flight programs, but that was a best kept secret. I've been to Andrews many times. I've seen the baseball field. I've seen so much of the campus, but I never knew they were hiding a flight school behind the little bakery. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it wasn't rare. But it's a very interesting program. And uh, how do you, how long have you been involved in the program? So I've been at the, um, involved with the program since early 2018. Okay. Um, so I am involved with it. Before that, I was a mission pilot in Chad, Africa. Mm. Um, and I actually came and did a program here with 3ABN um, before talking about that project. Wow. And now God has guided me and brought me to Andrews. And so it's, it's a privilege to be involved with it. Wow, wow, that's wonderful. And uh, that's interesting to see that the school offers that kind of curriculum. Uh, how many students practically, right? Uh, Jonathan, do you know, or even Jeremy, what kind of student base do you have at, that's interested in this kind of program? At Andrews, we have a flight program and a maintenance program. Mm -hmm. So we've got about a dozen students in the maintenance program and about 30 or 40 students in the flight program. And are there any that do both programs? Because Absolutely. Because okay, yeah. if you have flight, do you want to know how your plane is working? Yeah. yeah. So uh, those that are interested, we highly recommend having both. And then you're a well-rounded, uh, complete individual ready mm. for the industry. Yeah. That's good. And, and, and uh, We even have scholarships for those that choose to do both just because we encourage it so much. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. I like that because it does cost. It's not like a regular curriculum. Just give us, and we're going to talk about some of the funding and scholarships that can go along with helping this kind of program go on, but just give us an idea of what it costs like that, a four-year program for a flight, including flight hours and the use of the plane generally. So in general terms, right now we're sitting at about the cost of tuition for Andrews plus $65,000. Okay. And that brings you from zero experience all the way until you can start teaching other people how to fly in an aircraft. That's good, because so. that's what you want to be able to do. That's right. And that includes flight experience, landing and takeoff? Flight experience, landing, takeoff, um, and Solo. everything in between. Yep. We even train you into how to fly in a crew-type environment, mm. um, preparing you for the airlines. And um, we have a letter of authorization from the FAA that allows our graduates to go to the airlines in a, in a thousand hours rather than 1500, which is the current regular requirement mm. for anybody going through flight training. So, so. That's, so that's saying that the, the training is very extensive. Yeah, because, because of uh, the airplanes that we have, because of our maintenance, because of our teachers, because of our curriculum, all of that comes together in a complete package and because it's more complete and more thorough than just going and flying your own airplane for 1500 hours the FAA says that you get better training if you come through our curriculum did you hear that better training flight instruction as well as maintenance at Andrews University when you talk about 500 hours less by going through this program that's cost effective mm -hmm. that's right and that's a lot of I mean that 500 hours is 500 hours when you talk about renting a plane to get 500 hours or going to get 500 hours training or whatever the case may be, when you put that together, because you've been on a, an aircraft carrier, uh, talk about the maintenance. I mean, you're talking about the United States Navy. Those guys that when that plane takes off, how critical is the maintenance of an airplane? Oh, it's, it's incredibly critical. Uh, the, the components, they just, they, they really can't fail. You know, they, they have to work, <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> otherwise you're going to find yourself going for a swim or, or uh, having to unfortunately punch out, which is not, not a fun as aspect of flight. Right. right. Yeah. And punch out is not a physical act, but... No, I'm sorry, <laughs> eject out of the airplane. Right, eject, okay, good. Yeah, thank you. I want yeah. to clarify that because I knew what you meant, but, you know, somebody might say, why would they hit the flight instructor? <laughs> <laughs> you can't exactly pull off on the side of the road and fix your broken tire. You've got to know how to handle everything that comes. That's right. So you are very particular, uh, Jonathan, about what you approve. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, at the end of the end of my inspections, I have a logbook entry and I put my name on it. And if something happens, the FAA is coming and asking me questions. So yeah, I mean, everything I do, I have to be very particular and very specific about to make sure that it's 100% top notch, ready to go every yeah. time. Yeah, and the reason, I, the reason I'm approaching this so early in the program is this, that uh, you, know, you hear about accidents, 
whether it's a single engine plane or whether it's a commercial jet, FAA is involved at every level. Yes, that's right. And let's see what happened. Like, uh, heard about uh, some planes that had collided in uh, Alaska, mm. and you know the unfortunate incident there uh, that was just pretty commercial, taking people to see the mountains and the things, and and so those small little details is the difference between life and death. Yeah. So right. there's nothing that you can overlook. Yeah. So we've got one of our airplanes is from 1959 mm -hmm. and it's still flying because we do maintenance. <laughs> I mean, how many cars are on the road from 1959? That's true. Um, but we just inspect them all the time and make sure that they're all up. And if anything is, is even looking like it's starting to go, we replace it and make sure it's, it's safe. Yeah. And I'm a little bit more detailed in flight than many of the regular talk show hosts because I, I like to fly too, but do not ask me to fly you in my plane. I don't have one unless you want to be in a model airplane. <laughs> but um, so you know about the fail, like how long this piece of equipment should be in a plane. It shouldn't go beyond these hours and all yep. that kind of thing. Yeah. Good, yep. good. But now give us some more. Talk about some of your missions because each one of you has been involved in some type of mission. Talk about some of these missions that you've been involved in. Well, you know, the interesting thing about, uh, about being a pilot is uh, we happen to have a very unique perspective being in the air. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, just as it happens to be in Revelation 14, 6, it talks about, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, uh, proclaiming the gospel to those that dwell upon the earth. And so, uh, like you said, we may not be angels, but we do have the opportunity to spread the gospel, and we can use flight to do that. Uh, there is a man by the name of Dick Hall. Mm -hmm. uh, he took that very seriously. Back in 1957, he was a pastor, missionary to, uh, uh, I think it was the Hmong people in the country of Laos. Mm. Uh, he helped build the church there, was actually the first Adventist presence in that country. Mm -hmm. And because of his energy, the effort he put forth, there are people, I mean a whole nation group in fact, um, in the Adventist church who would not have been had he not been able to do that. Mm -hmm. And it was all because he was able to fly, which is pretty awesome. And it shows how important it can be for us. And this also, it also has an impact to you too because you had somewhat of a conversion experience. I uh, did. When you were involved in the Navy. T tell us about that. Well, very, I'll try to keep it as short as possible, but uh, <laughs> I did have a conversion experience and I had always been searching, trying to learn Bible truth and I'd, I'd been to several different churches, you know, I won't name denominations, but I, I wasn't afraid to ask questions and so that's what I did. And as I would read the Bible, I kept on seeing things about the Sabbath, you know, and I was like, well, I, I think that's more of a legalistic thing that doesn't apply to us now. And I asked my pastors and I got like three different answers from all of them. And so I decided, well, I'm just going to research it myself. It can't hurt. You know, I'm supposed to know the Bible for myself. And so I did. And the more I read the Bible, the more I realized that perhaps I wasn't as right as I thought I was, that the Bible actually talked about the Sabbath and the Sabbath still applies today. And mm -hmm. um, that just it changed my, my perspective on things actually. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, uh, while I was in the Navy, I, I would have to say that it, it probably led me to desire a different lifestyle mm -hmm. than, I, than I had then. And according to my own personal convictions, I felt that it was time for me to, to go elsewhere and God miraculously worked it out so that I could do that and actually learn and submit my faith more. It was mm. beautiful. Yeah. That was interesting. And that was as you were transitioning out of the military. Correct. Because the Lord had another direction for you. He did. Uh, that you were not aware of, but you know, those little taps on the, on the heart's door made a difference. Absolutely. He, so to speak, navigated you. He did. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> he became the, 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 uh, the, the, the lead pilot. He was the lead pilot. Okay. I was his wingman. Yeah. Good, you were wing <laughs> wow, that's, that's interesting. But now you talked about missions. Uh, share some more about missions because uh, missions could be uh, in various parts of the world, but in various aspects. And how does flight play a role in missions? Well, I think one of the big things with flight and missions, you know, you think about the the quintessential mission pilot who's flying into these remote unimproved strips and dropping off Bible workers or construction materials to build a church and stuff like that. And that is definitely a, a very necessary part. But 
being a mission pilot, you also have the opportunity to reach others who may not necessarily have the contact that you would need. For instance, you're meeting with the civil aviation authorities in that country. Mm -hmm. um, you're meeting with other missionary families. So um, one story that I have from that is I was working, when I was in Africa, I had the opportunity to share uh, um, an understanding of the state of the dead mm. with a, another missionary, mission pilot who was there. He was working with one of the evangelical groups. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, God sorted it out so that we were able to, to talk about this subject. And, you know, we just opened up a discussion and we're like, okay, so you believe this, why do you believe that? Mm -hmm. And, well, you know, I was able to sit down with them and have lunch and talk through it. And we were saying, you know, like, the, how can the soul be eternal? It says an eternally burning fire, but fire can only burn as long as there's wood to burn. That's right. And so bringing these truths and these principles, it was being able to reach him mm -hmm. at a spot where he was supposed to be serving and he was supposed to be ministering. But it, God gave me that opportunity to, to reach him, and I don't think anybody else would have been able to reach him in the same way at that same moment. Right, because being a, being a pilot, him being also involved in the same thing, that's right. brought you to a point, an intersection that is. Uh, that, that's, that's really good. And it makes a difference what people believe. And I, I think about flight in this respect. And if you compare flight and, and uh, spirituality or the Bible together, uh, details matter. Jonathan, yeah. do details matter? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he said, that's a small detail. It's just a small crack. <laughs> Not a big issue right now. It'd be okay. It's used for maybe 10 or 12 more flights. I mean, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> details matter. Details matter. They, they make a difference. But you also um, I had an experience uh, to touch a person's life uh, when an unfortunate experience happened with somebody that you were able to get in touch with. Talk about that. Yeah, so the Lord has blessed me, and, and a lot of my uh, ministering opportunities have been more uh, friendship evangelism. And so right after I got a A&P school, I was in a shop where we were painting airplanes. Mm -hmm. And one of my coworkers, uh, I was there for about a year and a half, and it was a secular shop. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, being a Christian in a secular shop, it was difficult in a lot of circumstances. But, you know, I, I chose to remain faithful, and my conversation and the way I interacted with the, my coworkers was very intentional. And uh, so while I was there, one of my coworkers, his daughter was born, but she was born with a heart defect. Mm. And a couple of months later, she went away. She, she passed away. It was very unfortunate. But that night when she passed away, my coworker called me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was the person that he called in the middle of the night when he needed his help. Wow. And uh, so I spent some time with him on the phone and prayed with him. And it was very touching mm -hmm. to, even though being in a secular environment, yeah to have that connection where I didn't realize what was going on. Mm -hmm. But when he knew that he needed some, some help, I was, I was his friend that he called. That's right, maintaining your faith. Yeah. Where it might be easy to compromise because everybody around you wouldn't even fight the idea that, hey, you know, Jonathan, let's hang out. Let's have a couple of drinks. Let's just go out and do whatever. And you maintained your faith so that when the critical hour came, somebody knew who to call. Praise Absolutely. God for that. You know, that kind of, I know you were in a challenging environment also, but at the time that you were in the Navy, uh, at what point did your spirituality begin to kick in and you're searching? Great question. So God has, he has many ways of working with us. And of course, he knows us very well. Uh, I, I would unfortunately consider myself pretty hard-headed. And so, <laughs> uh, you know, just in my normal thought process and normal way of doing things, I just thought, well, you know, uh, I'm learning these new truths, but I've already made my commitment here, and so I'm, perhaps I might have to do things that are going against the Bible, but I have to honor my commitment that I already made. If I said I'm going to do it, I need to follow it through. Mm -hmm. But as it so happened, I injured myself, mm. unfortunately, uh, doing some exercises, and during that time, God God just really spoke to my heart. I wasn't flying. I had more time to read and understand and study uh, Bible truths, and he happened to take me to a, a church that was very nurturing. And so by the time everything was all said and done, I was so much more solid in my faith. Mm. And, uh, you know, 
it was it was certainly challenging because let's just say that people weren't very supportive of my conversion. Mm. How about that? And uh, in the military, even if you do want to stand for what you believe in, the mission comes first. Wow, that's you know, right. I mean, that's just the way it is, and especially because we're a volunteer uh, military right now, you know, you, ha you have to keep that in mind. And so it was, it was very challenging, very challenging, but God also used me to be able to be a witness to some people. Okay. Um, I think even in those moments when I was struggling, which was pretty awesome. He could still, he could still find, you know, this, uh, whether you are a full burning fire or a coal, there's still a flame there. Yeah. And that's the right. beautiful thing. There's some light coming. Now, I want to, I want to kind of show this video we have uh, because we brought some footage here to kind of give some people an idea. And after the video, we'll comment on what they saw. Let's roll the video right now. I could just say the word nice. <laughs> That's nice. You want to be able to take off. Were you involved in the maintenance of that craft also? Absolutely, yeah. So that was, uh, that was uh, the end number on that is 27 off the uniform. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a new airplane that we just purchased in 2014. Okay. And as you notice, it had the glass cockpit. It's got yeah. the G1000 avionics in it. Mm -hmm. So the old, uh, older aircrafts have the round steam gauges is what we call them. Mm -hmm. uh, but the newer ones are the glass cockpit. Nice, but so, then you have secondary instruments. Yeah, we've got a secondary instrument on the side. So it's, it's brand new, cutting edge technology type stuff, yeah. Wow, have, you, have either of you driven, uh, flown in that plane? Yeah, we yeah. fly into them regularly. Yeah, I also want to show this picture we have because you guys flew down here. You know, most of our guests drive here. <laughs> uh, they did drive from the airport here, but I want to show this plane and let's talk about that plane, the, the nice uh, plane that we have. This is a uh, Piper Arrow. It's got retractable gear. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is what we flew down on yesterday. Nice. And does this have the glass cockpit? This is an older airplane. This is from 1974. Okay. Um, but it's got the same paint job as what we currently have. Talk about this picture here briefly. So this was an airplane that was donated about a year and a half ago. It was down in Tennessee. And we took uh, about uh, 10 students down to Tennessee over the weekend. And we took that airplane apart, took the wings off of it, took the horizontal stabilizer off of it, put it on a semi-truck trailer, and drove it back up to Andrews. What kind of plane is this? This is a Lear 25 Learjet. Um, holds about six or eight people. Wow, wonderful. That's nice to be able to, hey, let's go for a flight today. Mm. <laughs> very <laughs> convenient. <laughs> very convenient. How much flying, uh, how much flying is a part of the program? Let me, let me rephrase the question. At what interval does the student transition from book to the equipment? Right, right away. Right away. Right away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we found that if you try to teach theory without the practical application, it just goes in one ear and out the other. Mm -hmm. People don't really understand it. So we strive to get people, our students, in the airplane as soon as possible so that they're marrying the two together, the, the theory of aerodynamics and whatever else, mm -hmm. 
with the practical application and so they come together and it makes a more holistic pilot out of it. That makes sense because if you're teaching somebody art, you could teach them the history, you could talk about all the various artists through the 17th century, the t different types of art. But if they never pick up a paintbrush or a pencil, <laughs> or, he's like, uh, we're just learning about art, but I've never drawn anything yet. Right. That's true. That makes sense. That makes sense. I, I mean, um, I, I, like, I like pertaining to flight. I, I'm not a flight instructor. I'm not a pilot. But um, I'm, I'm very interested in the fact that when you talk about this kind of program, it's not just something that's for overseas. Talk about some of the local uh, benefits of having the gift of flying at local missions? Well, so one of the big things is that the aviation industry here in the U.S. is very secular and unreached, um, typically because it's a 24-7 job. Right. And so people are running constantly, you know, whether they're going to get Sunday or Saturdays off to go to church, it's not a guarantee. Um, and so there's, there's close to one million aviation professionals, whether they're pilots, mechanics, dispatchers for the airlines. And I'd say based on what I've understood and learned throughout the industry, there's just a handful of avenists in the mm. entire industry here in the U.S. Mm. So it's a very unreached mission field. It's somebody, you know, it's, we, we don't have people who are there to share these truths and to build the relationships. That, that cause people to turn to Christ. So somebody watching or listening to the program, let's talk about this. How can people get involved in this program, uh, the Andrews program? I'll, I'll pitch it to any one of you. Go ahead. Well, say the number one thing they could do for us is, you know, continue to pray. You know, we're, we're certainly praying for our program, but we could use as many prayers as possible because, you know, mm -hmm. We've given the program over to the Lord. We've left it in His hands, and we want Him to guide and direct it to be the program that He wants it to be. Um, but along with that, there is also contributions as well. I think uh, Jonathan could probably say a lot about that. Yeah, right now we're wanting to um, grow our student population as much as possible. The industry right now is just crying for pilots. Um, the airlines, yeah, yeah, both. I mean, it's, it's astronomical right now. Um, they cannot fill, they're canceling flights in the airlines because they can't come up with enough pilots and mechanics to keep them going. Wow. And so the whole industry, because of the top industry needs pilots and mechanics, the, everybody underneath also needs pilots and mechanics. And so what used to take f 12 years to go to the majors is now taking like five. Mm. <laughs> and the pay is almost doubled in some of the industries. So they're trying to really uh, uh, appeal to the people to get in, involved in the industry because yeah. so the demand is high. The demand is high. Right. So we're trying to train professional pilots to fill those roles, but not just professional pilots, but individuals that are passionate about Jesus Christ. Yeah. And so uh, we're trying to double the amount of students that we're putting through our program. So with that, we need more airplanes. We need to uh, do some infrastructure upgrade. Mm -hmm. We want to put in a parallel taxiway and some stuff like that to make it uh, make everything flow a lot better. Okay, so your taxing is on the strip itself. Right now, yeah, and right now we have to back taxi, so if somebody's taxiing, you can't land, so. Okay. That's... So that would be able to double the amount of flights that we could get out of there. So let's, let's start mentioning some, what does something like that cost to put in, just generally, I would be, you know. Uh, parallel taxiway, we were looking at, what was it, fifty thousand mm dollars? -hmm. Uh, I think it was more than that. Yeah. Oh, I think because it's asphalt, it has to yeah, be regulations, all that. Yeah, yeah. Um, the two new mm -hmm. archers that we purchased, those were two hundred grand plus, mm -hmm. almost three hundred, three hundred and fifty, three hundred fifty plus. Three hundred and fifty. So for a brand new airplane, it's not cheap. <laughs> no, no. But the amount of pilots that we can push through with that single airplane, um, you know, we can take four or five flights a day with a single airplane. Mm -hmm. uh, we can push ten students through a week. So, mm -hmm. so each airplane is a massive asset. Mm -hmm. And how many do you have in the fleet right now? Is it about five? Either? Right now we're, we're working with five uh, Piper low-wing aircraft that we're flying currently. Yeah, we'd like more. Yeah. Um, and honestly, put in more aircraft that are the exact same type mm -hmm. maximizes our potential because we can have rolling over. So right now, if one of the airplanes goes, goes down for maintenance, mm -hmm. Now we have one less aircraft, and so the amount of flying that's able to happen becomes reduced because 
we, we just don't have the airplane. Yeah. Wow. And so by, by having additional aircraft that are all of the same type, you know, if one goes down, all right, well, here, we'll just adjust the schedule and fit these guys who were going to fly in that airplane into the existing schedule for the other aircraft. Now, I know there's a certain age to drive. What is the age introduction into flight? So I know most mothers would not want to hear this, but you can be <laughs> you can solo at age 14. <laughs> but that's how safe our training is and how safe the airplanes are. Wow. Um, is that we can do it at a much younger age. Wow. You got to be 16 you to get to your private good. license, yeah. so you can solo at 14. Yeah. So when did flight become a, uh, an interest of yours, uh, Professor? Uh, for me, that happened when I was probably five or six years old. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Dallas, Texas, and uh, lived right underneath the uh, approach path for a lot of the aircraft going in DFW. So for oh, me, wow. you know, it was, it was from an early age, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. Mm. Yeah. And uh, just continued from there. That's a unique place. Uh, my wife and I uh, think of the places like St. Martin in the Caribbean, oh, yeah. <laughs> where the beach is right in the approach path. Oh, yeah. You know, people, it's almost uh, 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 an attraction. Yeah. That's right. People go to St. Martin, you know, they, they see these 747s or big commercial planes diving in just, you know, feet above the sand to land and then also take off, but not toward the ocean. Very interesting mm -hmm. thing. So at an early age, you kind of get the idea that uh, this is what I want to do for my life. And then you, did you include that in your later years or you read books and Oh stuff? yeah, I just, once again, I, I got myself into it as much as I could. I attended camps, things like that. And the more I read, the more I thought, man, it would be really cool to be an astronaut. So I thought, well, let's, what do I have to do to be an astronaut? Uh, it looks like the astronaut corps, they like Navy pilots, so maybe I should become a Navy pilot. And I thought, well, so what, where's the best place to go? Uh, maybe I should, should go to the Naval Academy. And so I put in my paperwork and, you know, they accepted me to the Naval Academy. And so I, I just did all I could to put myself in a position to pursue that dream. Okay. And then, you know, once again, once I met God, he had, he had different, a different direction, which which has been even better. Yeah, yeah I, I guess your favorite hymn is I'll Fly Away. <laughs> <laughs> See that. But, uh, so let's talk about some of the specifics. When you, if a student enters into Andrews University uh, flight course, I want to specify that you have the regular tuition, but then if you want to enter into the flight program, that's a separate uh, cost altogether. Because, but that includes, the regular tuition includes the basics of flight or kind of help me understand that. Yeah, so the the cost of the airplane is really the, the major factor that adds to it. Okay. Um, ultimately, flying costs money. Right. And unfortunately, aviation is is a a high expense mm -hmm. um, ticket item. But initially, they're they're getting training in the airplane, flying their private pilot license. Mm -hmm. And so they have to do the flight training, they have to pay the, the flight instructor for that time. Um, and then we transition them to an instrument rating, mm -hmm. which is training students how to fly through the clouds, how to understand navigational charts so that we can follow navigational systems and, and you can make an approach and landing without ever seeing outside. Now that's I like that. <laughs> it's a lot of fun, especially when you get right down to the bare minimum altitude that you can fly to, and you're just coming out of the clouds right when you hit it. I'm one of those guys that I could hear very well. My wife and I, because of our mileage, we get a chance to sit in first class, and sometimes I could hear through the door, minimums, <laughs> minimums, <laughs> minimums. <laughs> and I know on approach what that means. Yeah. That means if you're going to decide to keep going or go around, this is the time to do it. Right. You know, um, and, but it's really interesting. What else would you say as you as people are listening to the program? What would you say to those who are uh, trying to decide? Is this what it is for me? Is this for uh, girls and guys? Uh, you know, is this something that? Uh, what would you say to attract somebody that may be thinking, what do I want to do for my future? For me, aviation uh, maintenance. I got in the maintenance program. Um, I needed to do something with my hands. Okay. Uh, so, so that's how I, I went with the, the maintenance side of it. But it's a very rewarding career. It's a very professional career. It's a very clean career. Um, you got to be very honest. You got to have a strong character. 
You know, if you mess up something, you got to be honest about it and let other people know, and you double check each other. Um, I double check the guys that are working with me, and they double check me. It's just the way that we do things. You know, these guys are flying yesterday, and they double check each other even now. It's just how we roll. That's just how aviation works. Um, that's how we fly. You that's mean. how we fly. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, it's for guys and girls. Uh, there's specific programs for females that are involved in aviation, um, both in the maintenance side and the, the flight side. Um, we've had a number of female students that have come through the program, so we definitely welcome them as well. Because I've seen a lot of female commercial pilots, yeah. mm -hmm. and they're more entering the industry flying large equipment, you know. Mm -hmm. And sure. uh, some people think, well, isn't it tougher to fly a larger, the larger? Well, the, you know, the principle is the same, aviation yeah. principle. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about those. I, I asked you before the program the language that they use to communicate. Alpha, Bravo, Kilo, oh, you know, sure. Romeo. Where did that come from? Well, so it came from um, back in the day in the World War II. Mm -hmm. We had fundamental radios that were hard to understand. And so when they were trying to communicate the different needs or the different coordinates or whatever it may be, they found that some words sounded like others, like three, I, three um, became tree yeah. mm -hmm. because the th of of um, the th wouldn't come through on the radio, mm. and you know nine became niner because right. the German word for no is nine, and oh. so they took niner and made it that way so that it wouldn't be confused with the word no. The word no. Wow, that's interesting. And there's that. so there's a lot of elements of it. You've got alpha. Bravo Charlie, the phonetic alphabet, mm -hmm. um, and they're very intentional to make sure that those words don't sound like, you know, if you had say C, it could be D, it could be E, it could be G. That's right. <laughs> over the radio, we're not sure what you said. And so now if we say Charlie, Delta, Echo, Golf, right. it, it's very clearly different. I like that, C-D-E-F. I mean, that makes a lot, of a lot of sense. And it's a language that sounds funny sometimes, but when you want to be clear, I like what you pointed out, the honesty needed, because if a pilot just says, oh, I messed up again, I don't want anyone to know, the plane is ready to go, <laughs> that could be the difference between somebody's life and death. Absolutely. So you might say, you know what, wait, 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 I'm not done yet, I need to get this switch put in. Yep. Do, can I fly without it? No, you're not going to fly without it. Yeah. So that right. kind of really pulls you into that perspective. And being a professor now, you're dealing with the students teaching. Talk about some of that curriculum approach. Uh, it's actually a very, uh, very awesome process to be a part of. Uh, you know, once again, I'm pretty new here, just six months under my belt here at Andrews. Okay. But I've come to learn and appreciate that uh, the way we do things is very systematic and it's very well thought out. And of course, there's always room for improvement, but I'd say we have a, a pretty strong program, which is awesome. Um, coming from a military background, even charter background, I love the systematic approach because, you know, for me, there's, <laughs> there's safety in that, you know? It's like, uh, I don't know. Yeah, like I said, just safety in that. And so it's, it's pretty awesome. I'd say the way we are, we are creating the curriculum for the students, you're just giving them some nice building blocks at the mm -hmm. beginning. And so by the time they get to their junior and senior year, they, they have what they need to be able to give it back to the students that are coming up behind them, which is pretty okay. cool. You know, somebody might be watching this program from a warm country. They have no clue where <laughs> Andrews University is. Give a general location. Give, a, give us some specifics as to, in America, where would Andrews University be located? Uh, Andrews is in the north of the country, it's in Michigan. Um, On the east coast? It's, yeah, more towards the east coast, mm -hmm. kind of in the central. Uh, if you look at the Great Lakes region of the U.S., mm -hmm. um, Michigan is literally sitting in the middle of all the Great Lakes. Wow. So Michigan kind of looks, they say, it kind of looks like a, a hand or a mitten. Okay. And Andrews is the very southwest corner. We're just north of Indi or Indiana. South Bend, Indiana. Okay. Now, there's the text in the Bible that says, pray that your flight be not in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> Is that true in Andrews? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pretty the cool. winter slows us down quite a bit. And so we have simulators, and we focus a lot of our flight training in the winter in the simulator. Now, the so. reason I mention that is because when you go to Andrews, you have to pray for the sun. You know, you say goodbye to it when the summer is on its oh. way. <laughs> <laughs> and you say, well, we have four more months before the sun shows up again. <laughs> so you do, you continue training, but in simulators. 
Right, we do simulators on our fair weather days. We do go out and we fly. Well, we might have a little bit of snow on the runway. That it's plowed, but it's snow. And so it's like, we'll yes, the that sun that is too. out today. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so we take advantage of it. Um, you know, it gives you cold weather environments that you get to learn how to fly in, you know, depending on how the wind is. So it does make for a better pilot. You get a more well-rounded experience. Yeah, it has they, to take care of your airplane and everything else. Yeah. They say uh, if you can land at Andrews, you're good anywhere. <laughs> what length of the runway is it? It's you... about 4,300 feet. Okay, that's, that's good. And uh, any specific you want to add to that about the, anything else you want to add to what was just commented on? As far as just flight training there? Yeah. Oh, uh, you know, the major, major contribution I'd like to, to say or add to that is that uh, we're always looking for ways to improve. And uh, like we said before, we, we are definitely trying to create pilots of character. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, that's a lot of times easier said than done. Mm -hmm. And so we, we are finding that um, the more we are closer to God, the more we can give to our, to our students. So we always covet your prayers for that. And um, the other thing we wanted to talk about is that we do have students that come through occasionally who are interested in going to the mission field. Mm -hmm. And we just want to support them 100% as much as possible, uh, give them the best, the best uh, stepping stone. Right, right to succeed and a lot of times it's difficult for them to get past some of the financial obligations that come with flight training in order yeah. to go to the mission field and so i'd say that's one of our our big needs too okay. is you know we we do have a mission fund and um it's it's at a certain level that we we feel could could be better in order to help support support that that aspect of our of our training we're going to talk about that, how, how people that are watching and listening can donate to that. But talk about some of the physical needs, some of the equipment needs. What are some of the things that uh, Andrews can actually look forward to? If it's new computers, new planes, new equipment, what are some of the things that will make this program uh, more stable or refurbish? One of the big things is our, our need for new airplanes. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have two very nice, brand new 2014 built uh, airplanes, and we need to have comparable airplanes that are also available so we can hand off. You know, like I said, if one goes down for maintenance, now that slows down the entire program um, because we only have two. Mm -hmm. And so if we have three or four of these types of aircraft, now our availability, if one of the maintenance items comes up, everyone is still able to fly and continue flying. Um, so that's one of our big needs. Another need that we will um, hit very soon when we start getting more students is larger facilities and okay. being able to have a larger classrooms, um, more office space for our flight instructors to do their flight instruction training mm. on the ground. Um, and the, the parallel taxiway yeah. that opens up our capacity, that will almost triple the amount of flying, flights that we can accomplish in a day. Yeah, that parallel taxiway is not an understatement by any yeah. means because, <laughs> no. you know, right now, if you, if you think about it this way, if this is the runway, you're, you, this is where you want to take off or land. If there's no parallel taxiway, you're kind of going up and down, up and down, and you can't take off and land while somebody's taxiing, mm -hmm. which right. is a very important thing. Any other equipment? What about maintenance equipment? Anything like that needed or? No, we, uh, I mean, eventually facilities, if we get more, more airplanes, we're definitely gonna need to, to have a bigger facility to be able to, to maintain them all. Mm -hmm. um, and that's all just growing pains and just part of the process of making it happen. Um, but we're, I mean, we're an international school. We're prepared to take students from all over the world. Right. Um, Andrews, their claim to fame is that we're the most internationally diverse ethnically diverse university in North America. Wow. So we know how to handle visas, we know how to handle all that kind of stuff. So we're, we're willing and ready to take students. And so that's another big thing we need. We just need people to come. <laughs> that's right. We're passionate about aviation, we're passionate about sharing Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, we just need people to, to do it with us. And, and this is a, yes. Oh, and I was gonna say one of the advantages of having the common aircraft fleet is that if something goes wrong, now, because we all have, we're flying the same airplane, we can already have parts available and we can already have pieces and components of the aircraft available so we don't have to order it out and wait for a week for it to be shipped from wherever. Mm. 
Jonathan can have it on on the shelf and just pull it out and put it on the airplane and get it out that same day if need be. That does uni uniformity it, is important. It yeah. makes a, it'll make a big difference in the operations. That's why is the Blue Angels Navy? They are. I They're thought right. so. <laughs> Those kind of pilots you can't trust them to any other branch of the military but the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> just putting it in <laughs> But uh, I want to be able to give you some information to get in touch with uh, uh, David, Jonathan, and Jeremy. And, and also to find out more about this aviation program. As you can tell, I'm excited about it, but uh, you may want to find out what your student prospectively would uh, want to be able to uh, do to get to enroll in this program for the maybe upcoming semester. Here is the information that you're going to need. If you are interested in a flying career, or if the Lord has impressed you to be a missionary pilot, then check out the Andrews University Department of Aviation and their flight, maintenance, and missionary pilot programs. Their website is andrews.edu slash aviation. That's andrews.edu slash aviation. You may also call them at 269-471-3120. If you prefer, you may also write to them at Andrews University Department of Aviation. 3898 Griggs Avenue, Berrien Springs, Michigan 49104. As you know, our time comes and goes so quickly, but there's some very important details that we want to leave you with, and uh, I'll turn the time over to you. Tell us what else we can expect and what else is, is pertinent to this program, David. Well, so one of the things that we really wanted to highlight on this is our desire to help people who are transition or who are interested in transitioning to the mission field mm -hmm. after they get out. Um, so, as Jeremy alluded to earlier, we have students who come in and they want to be mission pilots, but what we found is the the financial obligations of all the additional flight training on top of tuition builds up a, a fair amount of debt for most people. Mm -hmm. And that debt becomes a, a detriment to people who are working in the mission field. Right, because you're not in the mission field to make a lot of money. That's right, <laughs> yeah. definitely. That's right, and most of, the, most of the aviation organizations that we have are self-supporting, so you're building your own finances and your own support group. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I've been there, it, it's, it's a tough life to, mm -hmm. to have to do all your own fundraising and wow. survive on it. So, um, so, so, so what we would like to do is through through the Andrews organization, um, we have some mission money and we'd like to get more mission money so that we're specifically helping our students offset the cost of the flight training through mission service. Mm. So if they sign on for a two-year, five-year, seven-year commitment, mm -hmm. we're helping pay off their student loans as they're in their mission field That's and build in their opportunities to, to be abroad while they're working. That's a wonderful incentive. you know. So anything you want to add to that, Jonathan or Jeremy? Uh, no, I, I mean, that's our priority is to send people to the mission field, both foreign and domestic. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they have other responsibilities, if we can take that off their plate and allow them to focus on on their on their mission mm -hmm. that would be pretty fantastic so uh where do you fly from here <laughs> <laughs> you head back to andrews heading back to andrews wow you know safe flying for all of you uh i would say after this program i'll say you're clear for takeoff <laughs> but thank you for coming here today you know if you're listening to the program and watching you may be driving thinking well i don't want to drive all the time i want to fly sometimes i want my life to so to speak, my career to get off the ground, the term that we often use, which is very pertinent to this program today. And uh, thank you, David. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Jeremy, uh, for coming here today and letting our viewers and listeners know that, yeah, there is a future out there for aviation. The three angels do want to fly, and we can connect them together to carry the gospel throughout all the world, both in the mission field abroad and here in America. God bless you until we see you again. <laughs>